Pastor Robert T. Smith is a native of Chattanooga, Tennessee, a third generation preacher. He is a product of Seventh-day Adventist Christian School from grammar school to graduate school. He holds a BA in theology, Masters of Divinity, Doctorate of Divinity, and a Doctorate of Philosophy. He has served as an ordained minister of the Seventh-day Adventist Church for over 30 years, working in Southeastern California, Allegheny West Conference, South Atlantic Conference, Southeastern Florida Conference, Southern Union Conference, Oakwood College, and the Great Allegheny East Conference. Amen. He has preached for and conducted evangelistic meetings and workshops in over 130 countries on six continents. Mm. His hobbies are snowmobiling, scuba diving, horseback riding, golfing, convention and meeting planning, gourmet cooking, and playing the keyboard. He currently serves as a member of the POST Certified Chaplains. The Long-Term Recovery Board for the State of New Jersey, the NAACP, 100 Black Men of America, the National Coalition of Black Meeting Planners, and the Religious Conference Meeting Association. He has also served on the Literature Ministry Coordinating Board, the Review and Herald Publishing Association Board, the Pacific Press Publishing Association Board, and the North American Division Research and Development Committee. He is also a Master Guide of the Seventh-day Adventist Pathfinder Club. He has been married to Miriam Hughes Smith, who is an educator for over 30 years. They have one adult son, Alex, who is currently a banker. His favorite Bible scripture is Matthew 1, 21. And she shall bring forth a child, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, and he shall save his people from their sins. Amen. Let's bring on Dr. Smith. What an extensive legacy and blessing it is to be able to have a speaker of Dr. Smith's caliber. And Dr. Smith is so wonderful to see you tonight. We're Elder give you Dr. The whole Julian, area. Elder Board, co host Elder Johnson, and friends of mine in the Agape Fellowship. I took my jacket off. I didn't want to look overdressed. I, <laughs> I, I've been running all over the place today, this weekend. But, um, Going through this pandemic, as you know, I work with community service here in Allegheny East, and I've seen with these fires and with the situation down in Louisiana, I've seen a lot of destruction. And um, I'm, just, I'm just glad, you know, that, um, that, that God is, is just so, so good to all of us. So I guess everybody can see me and video is good, audio. Everything okay. is good. All right, well, let's get into the word. Nothing new, just the same old gospel. It gets sweeter and sweeter. I want to talk about something that is affecting all of us. And during this pandemic, especially with the PPE and the PPP, uh, I want to talk about money, but not in the sense of that we used to talk about money. I want to talk about what money cannot do. Um, the text is Jeremiah. I'm going to use nine, chapter 9, and I'm going to look at 23 and 24. Jeremiah says it like this, thus saith the Lord, let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches, but let him who boasts in this, that he understands and he knows God. So that's what I want to talk about this evening, about us and how we deal with each other and the Bible has a lot to say about money. So I want to just deal with a few scriptures and a few things. Um, my question this evening as we start, let us pray. Father, now as we open your word, continue to open our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. My question this evening, how rich are you? How rich are you? Just think about it for a moment. 
I found a website that gives an instant answer on this question. It's called the Global Rich List. Basically, it compares our income with the average income of everyone else in the world. And it tells where we stand. So let's plug in a few um, figures. According to Forbes magazine, the minimum uh, household income, and let's use, it's got one for Dallas. Dallas and Fort Worth, the average household income, not the highest, not the lowest, but the average is $58,000. The global rich list says that these figures are, if you live in Dallas and you make 58,000, you're in the 0.2% of the world's richest people. If you make $58,000, you have made more than $99.8, more than that many people on the planet Earth. We're looking at the worldview. You may not feel rich, but compared to the rest of the world, you're doing just fine. Let's, let's try some other figures. If you have made $40,000, you live in Dallas, you made $40,000, you're in the upper 0.6%. If you made 20,000, you're in the upper 4%. And if you made just $10,000 last year, you're in the upper 16% of the world's population. The Gallup poll of the world's income reports that 22% of the world lives on less than a dollar 25 cent a day. And 34% of the world lives on less than $2 a day. Now let those figures sink in. If you make $2 a day, you make more than 34% of the world's population. We think nothing, you and I, of spending $2 on a cup of tea or, or a, a soft drink. In America, there isn't much you can buy that's $2. But that's a day's income for one third of the world's population. If you happen to be among those listening tonight, let me break it down real simple. If you live in the United States, you are fortunate to be at a level that 1% of the world's population would love to live the way we live. The conclusion is simple. I'm rich and so are you. Now, you may not think it, but we're rich. If you have a smartphone, just think about it. If you own a smartphone, you are rich. I can't even get a, I got a dumb phone. I, got a, I still use a, a, a BlackBerry. But if you got a smartphone, then you are rich. If you have indoor plumbing, you are considered in the world's view as being rich. If you drive just a car, a piece of car, I'm talking about a jalopy or a hoopty, if you have a car, then you, in the world's view, you are rich. If you have a credit card, even if it's bootleg, even if it's one of those no-name ones, then you are rich. If you got a job that pays enough so you can have a roof over your head, you are considered rich. It happens that way. Now, the same is true for nearly everyone who's listening tonight. Let's face it, if you are trying to survive on $2 a day, you're probably not in the United States. Now, there's a, 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 a book that's out. Matter of fact, it's a, it's a doctoral thesis by a young lady named Lynn Paramore. She names seven things, weird things that money can do to your mind and to my mind. And these are seven things that messes your brain up. The article is based on a neuroeconomic study that she wrote on the brain and how it makes decisions. Lynn Paramore states in her thesis up front, a lot of stuff is going on in your brains when you think about money. And she gives these, these examples. She says, money kills empathy. And we wonder why people with money are not empathetic. She says, your brain responds. People say 
this one thing, if I had only $10 million, I'll give it to charity. I'll give some to charity, but they don't really mean it, she says. Money actually makes you less generous. Number two, she says, losing money hurts, literally. We hate losing money more than we love making money. Number three, the more money, the less ethics you have. People who drive expensive cars, they did a study, are four more times likely to cut people off in traffic. And the worst drivers are BMW drivers. You know, they're very rude, very cantankerous and out road rage on the road. Number four, the more money you make, the more you think about money. How much money is enough, the question comes. As a rich man once said, just one more dollar. Just give me one more dollar. Number five, men with a lot of testosterone do weird things with money. Men are so wired and so competitive that they would rather see a rival lose than to win themselves. And telemarketers know this, that the brain treats credit different than it treats cash. Let me break it down this way. Marketers know that we spend 12 to 18% more with a credit card than we will do if we were paying for cash. And now during this pandemic, a lot of folks don't even wanna take your cash. They want you to use a debit card, a credit card, something that you don't, they don't have to exchange and touch because they think virus is on the money. And it's been proven that most money, dirty money and filthy lucre has so many particles of cocaine and, and illicit drugs and germs and disease on it. And then number seven, the wealthy perceive, are perceived as evildoers. <laughs> the poor, they really enjoy the wealthy suffering because the tendency to envy lies deep within all of us. The poor enjoys that, she found out in her study. And as we go through this sermon, let's look at the backdrop of Jeremiah. And let's look at the backdrop of the New Testament and James, especially James 1, 9 through 11. Against this black job, this backdrop, we hear God saying, as he ponders the verse, remember the most early Christians when people first joined the church in the early century, they were poor people. And as the gospel spread across the Roman Empire, it first impact the lower strata of society, which is exactly what Jesus predicted in Matthew 11, when he said one mark of the kingdom would be the poor would have the good news preached to them. The coming of Christ brings about a reversal in the fortune of society. The poor will have the gospel preach. The proud, the Bible says in Matthew, will be brought low the humble will be uplifted and the poor will hear the good news of Jesus Christ. And since most of the people that were listening to Christ and James back then, they were poor people. And then James said in verse nine of chapter one, he says, let the lowly brother boast in his exaltations. That is very startling when we look at this message that he says in different translations. In the CEB, it goes like this. Brothers and sisters who are poor should find satisfaction in their high status. <laughs> the ERV says it like this. The believers who are poor have something to boast about because God had, has honored them. Another version says, the believers who, who are poor shall be glad that God considers them to be so important. That's the ERV. The Living Bible, which is a paraphrase, says it like this. A Christian who, does, who doesn't amount to much in this earth should be glad for he is great in the sight and the eyes of the Lord. When we think carefully about this, James is saying, he's not really saying, if you're flat broke, you need to rejoice. But he's saying you need to think about your, your plight in life. He's not saying if you can't pay your mortgage and your children are starving, 
you should rejoice. Obviously, it's better to have a job and it's better to take care of your family. But if you are Christians, you have grounds to rejoice, even in a pandemic, even in this situation, even in poverty, even facing eviction, you have a reason to boast, even when the world despises you, when the world says you are bomb, God says you are still my child. God doesn't keep score the way we do. We are impressed by people with money. We like things to go uh, our way. And we like things that go with being wealthy, the bling, the flash, the bling, the trinkets, the toys, the fast cars, the big house, the vacation home, the jewelry, the jets, the bodyguards, the press coverage, and you know all that stuff that Hollywood makes you think you important. And if we weren't impressed, then Hollywood would go out of business. If we didn't love celebrities, TMZ would go out of business. If we didn't secretly dream of getting quick, rich, quick, uh, casinos would disappear and state lottos would go to bust. Even in the Christian world, even in your church and my church, uh, when people join the church, we we uh, sort of you know we, we you know we sort of put them on blast and, and, and like to show them off and give them the best seat uh, when famous folk come to Christ. We we give them like their trophies of grace, but God is not impressed with any of that stuff. The rich man and the poor man stands in the same ground before the Lord, our savior. Your net worth or your lack of net worth does not determine your self-worth and it has no impact on your standing in heaven. The ground is leveled at the foot of the cross. Somebody ought to say amen. We serve a God who speaks and the universe springs to life. He speaks and stars twinkle in the night. God speaks and eagles fly. He speaks and rabbits hop. He speaks and dolphins play in the water. God is a God who can call the Rocky Mountains in the place. Do you think he's impressed that you drive a Beamer? Do you think he's impressed that you live in a gated community? Do you think he's impressed when you have uh, associations with the Smiths, you know, Will and Pickett and Jada Pickett Smith, or you can hang out with Jordan, or you... Or you think you all that, a bag of chips and 10 cent change? But the reverse is true. God does not hold it against you if you are single and you are a mom that's barely making it, barely making ends meet. Not, <laughs> he's not embarrassed if you don't own a smartphone and you don't uh, kick it <laughs> with the rich and famous, or you may be getting kicked out on the street. And evicted, as was said, James says, poor people should rejoice in this one thing, in this one subject, when it comes to how you're stationed in life. You should rejoice that you know the Lord. You should rejoice that your sins are forgiven, that you are new in Christ. God is your father. Jesus is your Lord. The Holy Spirit leads you and guides you. Uh, that is what God is impressed with. And you can stand before kings and princes and priests, and you can stand before the Lord on the same ground level as anybody else. Oh, oh, friends, listen, tonight we need to learn this truth. There are no second class members in God's family. If you got money and a place to live, a good job, and you enjoy the accoutrements of comfort, give thanks but do not boast in your blessings. Likewise, if at this moment you're barely making it, if you are out of a job, if your family is in a mess, you toe up from the flow up, if your health is bad, if you're forgotten and feeling alone, if your health is bad, if you feel that God has forsaken you, if you wonder how you're going to make it, remember that your present condition does not determine your final destination. Let me say it again. Your condition right now does not determine your final destination. God has said that all his children will one day be with him in heaven. Some of us have it easy on the road that we're traveling through this life. Others 
have it much harder, but we will all get there the same way by the love and by the grace and the mercy of God. So let those who are poor in this world rejoice that their current condition is not their final destination. In the things that matter most, the poorest Christian is richer than the richest man in this world. The Bible says in James 1, verse 9, and the rich in his humiliation, because like the flower of grass will pass away, for the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass, the flower falls and its beauty perish. So also will the rich man fade in the midst of his pursuit. James has more to say about the rich than he does about the poor. Money can be a major complicating factor in life. We love money, we need money, we spend money, we sell our souls for money. Money, 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 money. Money can buy medicine, but it can't buy health. Money can buy a bed, but it can't buy sleep. Money, money, money. Some folk lose their soul over money. You can hold up a fistful of dollars and people can be impressed by money, but those bills are just ink, and that's all by themselves. Dollars or bills, uh, they are not good and they're not evil. It is what you do with them that matters. Sin is not in things, sin is in people. Sin is not in a nice car, it's where you drive that car. Sin is not in an instrument or a piano, it's what you play on the piano. Sin is in people, not in things. So let me put it this way. We fight to get our hands, we steal, we kill, we lie to get our hands on some quick cash, some people do. Uh, we'll do anything almost to get the chance of getting rich. That's the awesome power of stuff. And in light of this frantic attempt, James says, what's the point? You can't keep it up all your life. You're gonna die someday. And someone else will get all your money, all that stuff that you've been fighting over. What is the problem when it comes to us being greed and the greed factor? You worked so hard to get a nest egg that will protect you and build an empire. You buy a nice home, you get a second, third, and fourth car, and you have all this outward appearance of financial success, but one day, just keep living. You're gonna feel a pain in your chest, you're gonna have visitation, and then you're gonna have a funeral service, and then you're gonna have a graveside interment followed by a reception in the fellowship hall. You're gonna go in there after you've thrown some dirt on your casket, they're gonna leave you right there in that hole, go to the fellowship hall and eat some chickettes and some potato salad, and then they're going to say, oh, he looked so good in that casket. He looked like he was sleeping, but you still dead, even though you looking good. You know, somebody going to say, oh, he just had a checkup. He used to go to the gym and work out. He used to keep himself in good shape. And then they're going to say, plus he had all that money. Let's pause over that last statement. He had all that money. The past tense is correct because he doesn't have it now. Someone else has it. Maybe his kids, maybe his wife and her new husband, maybe his business partner got his money. Maybe the creditors got your money. Maybe your frenemies, maybe your enemies, maybe your in-laws, maybe your outlaws, maybe your hospital bill wiped all your money out. Maybe uh, you died with your fortune some other way, and that's an old story to be repeated in every generation. No one is rich forever because no one lives forever. Perhaps you've seen the bumper stick on the back of the Porsche that says this, he who dies the most with the most toys win the game. Stupidest line ever said because you're still dead at the end of the day and someone else has all of your toys. Just visit the cemetery and go and walk around sometimes and read the epitaphs and ponder all those folk buried there. If you really want to see how this works, you go to an old cemetery and you ask the question when you're walking through the cemetery, 
like I do sometimes at the funeral. I just go and walk, read the tombstones. And then the question comes to me, are there any rich people buried there? Yes. Are there any poor people buried there? Yes. Now the question is, what do the rich dead and the poor dead have in common? They are both dead. Actually, that question needs to be rephrased. There are no such thing as rich dead and poor dead. The dead exist as completely one category, dead. The temporal distinction does not matter. A millionaire and a dollar heir is just a dead person. That's the point James make and want us to remember. But in the same sense, should the rich man boast about his uh, riches? I think it goes like this. It's not wrong for a Christian to be rich. In this world, some people will always have more money than you and me. And, and, and some people will have less. The mere fact of wealth isn't wrong, but it's certainly not a sin to be rich. It's not what you do uh, with your money that matters, but it's how you give it to the Lord and he makes you a steward of it. And that's what's important. And over the centuries, Christians have done a lot of good. We need folk even today to stand up and help those that are suffering during the pandemic. So the rich Christian boasts in their wealth, no, they shouldn't because God gave it to them. Should they boast in their giving? No, as a rule, giving is best kept private when people give, unless they wanna use an example to encourage other folk. So I end, when I think about the story of the rich man, you know the story, the rich man and the poor man, they stand in the exact place. They both depend 100% on the grace of God and his mercy. It may not seem at first, but certainly the rich man in Beverly Hills uh, appears to be better off and, than the man who lives in the slums of Mabaya. But appearance and appearances can be deceiving. If the poor man knows the Lord and the rich man doesn't, both now in eternity will look different. The poor man is better off than the rich man in eternity. Money can do many good things if you use it rightly. But here's one thing money can't do. It can't buy you a place in heaven. We used to sing a song growing up, humble me, humble me. It says, if religion was a thing that money could buy, the rich would live and the poor would die. So the Lord wants us to humble ourselves. Don't let him have to humble you because if he had to humble some of us, he would take away some precious things. So learn to humble yourself before the Lord. You can't buy a place in heaven. I love the story about the rich man on his deathbed negotiated with God for permission and to bring some earthly treasures to heaven. Because of the man's unusual request and faithfulness, God granted his request, but he had a stipulation. God told him he could only bring one suitcase with him when he was coming to heaven. The time arrived when the man presented himself before the pearly gates. He struggled carrying this big old heavy suitcase. Now this is a story, now this is an allegory, this is a story. And he stuffed this suitcase full of gold bars. St. Peter's at the gate, as the story goes. And he said, sorry, sir, you know the rules. You can't take it with you. But the man protested. God said I could bring out uh, this suitcase with me. After checking, St. Pete found out that an, an exception had truly indeed been granted. But just before the man entered, St. Pete said, OK, but I have to examine the contents of this suitcase first. And then the man opened the suitcase and when he saw the gold bar, St. Pete asked the man in a loud shout, you brought pavement to heaven? You see, this thing is true. The things that we value on this earth will not be valued in heaven. Gold is like pavement on the streets of heaven. No, you can't take it with you. Your ATM card won't work in the bank of heaven. The only thing that matters is 
What God has given you in the kingdom for eternity is what you do for him that will last. And then he'll say, well done, that good and faithful servant. It is good to think about those things during this pandemic. God looks at the way we treat one another, but God is not impressed about the stuff that we impress. God helps those, somebody said, who helps themselves. That is not a saying from God. But the Bible didn't say that, but we take Benjamin Franklin's statements and we make them biblical. It will be more accurate to say, God help those who can't help themselves, but aren't ashamed to admit it. The message is clear. Don't despair because of your poverty. Don't be proud because of your wealth. If we humble ourselves, come to Christ, he will save us just as we are, whether we are rich or poor. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth should not perish, but have everlasting life. You're rich, I'm rich, if we look at what God has done by giving us his son who died on Calvary's cross. He spilled drops of blood with our name inscribed in it. He has made us heirs of salvation. What more could we ask for? Amen. Let God be the one that we boast in this world during this pandemic. Thank you, thank you, thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Elder. Thank you, thank you for the powerful message on money. Money has always been an issue for us. I, I praise the Lord that for this insight you've given to us. Amen. We're going to seek the Lord in prayer to close out our meeting tonight and remind everybody that there's no meeting on Monday night, but on Tuesday night we have another preacher, Dr. George Thornton from Kentucky. Let's give the man of God a good amen. amen. You ought to send him a, on, your, on the chat line and, and send in your messages. Tell him, praise the Lord. Encourage his heart, and let's continue to pray. Uh, I want to thank my co-host for tonight, Dr. Julian Johnson. Amen. Thank you so much as your continued blessing upon him. Let's seek the Lord tonight as we close out. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. May it be a light to our path that we might see clearly how to live in these dangerous and dastardly times when men's hearts are failing them for fear, look upon the things coming on the world. We cling to our money. We cling to those things we feel are important. Help us to value the truth of your word, to value the experience of coming to know Jesus for ourselves, and may that carry us on through the pandemic and through the pandemics to come and the situations we're facing. Now bless all listening to me tonight. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our heart keep us throughout the night. We ask these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen? Amen. Good night, everybody. God Amen. bless you. God